Good morning and welcome to episode three of Cloud Chats, navigating the Paz Skates space with Phil Doherty. Uh, I'm your host, Mason Egger. And, and I'm your co-host, Chris Sev, and we are developer advocates at DigitalOcean. Yes, yes. Awesome. So let's go ahead and start with our cold open today. Um, Chris, what programming language do you want to learn in 2021? Um, and in chat, let us know too, because there's a lot of fun stuff happening in 21. I feel like I've heard so much about Golang for the past, like, how long has Golang been out for four or five years now? Well, Golang it's... itself is like almost 10, but it didn't reach popularity until mm. like, like, I think mass popularity until the last four or five years. Yeah. Yeah. I have been hearing so much about it and how amazing it is that. That's one of them. Um, Rust is the other one. And Wasm, WebAssembly. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people talking about WebAssembly. Um, those are pretty much my two as well. Golang. I've I've done a Golang course. I've written, I write a little bit of Golang. I wrote a Golang um, open source tool for Hacktoberfest this past year, which was really cool. Um, but... I'm not, I was never the biggest fan of like C C type languages and Golang really is a C based a C type like like language. It behaves very much like C. Um, it's got some cool features. I've happened to unfortunately have run into a couple of weird bugs in it that kind of irk me. But I think every language has that. Rust is also really popular. Rust has taken over the space, um, and I want to learn. I want to actually finally learn and understand CSS this year. Um, like <laughs> is not like I I know a little bit of HTML. I want to I want to fine tune that out, but I think I know enough HTML that I can do a decent job. But like I still change CSS sheets and pray. That's that it's 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 a save and pray. Reload the web page. Did it work? No. Find something else and change it and hope that what I want comes through. Um. So that's what that's my goals for this year is definitely learning those languages. CSS is tough. I. I don't know. I've spent countless hours and hours figuring out how floats and positioning works, but um, I don't know. I have so much fun with CSS. I feel like that's one of the few things uh, that you can write where you can like immediately have visual feedback, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just so fun. That is pretty cool. I, I think that the problem that I have with CSS is that I've never actually... I think I've only written one website from scratch where I, where I wrote the CSS. I usually wind up finding a template that I like and I am terrible at grokking CSS. So I kind of have gotten a little bit better over the years, but there have been times that I have started working on a website, found a template that I like, cannot figure out how to make the tweaks to the template. And then I just find another template. Like that is a common pattern for me. So I'd like to be able to stop doing that. Um, and I'd like to just learn like, you know, I, I had a friend of mine recommend grid. Like she really likes grid CSS. Um, and I think she gave me a demo one time at PyCon and it was really cool. So what do you think? What, what, what's, where should I go for CSS? What should I learn? Should I learn vanilla CSS? Um, so I actually think, yeah, you should learn vanilla CSS. I mean, usually you want to learn the, the vanilla version of the language, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big fan of Tailwind right now, which I think is just like CSS shorthand pretty much. Okay. Um, but you know what? I have a lightning tutorial on today's schedule, and I have not what's on the schedule. So I can do a CSS grid uh, tutorial if you want. I can throw that out. Whatever you, whatever you think. Like I, it's totally <laughs> whatever you want. Uh, Mateo in chat says that he wants to learn uh, Python and maybe C Python. That's that's awesome. Python is my primary language. I do a lot with Python. What does everyone else in the chat want to learn this year? What language? What framework? What tool? Like there might be some really cool tools you want to learn this year. I actually want to finally dig deep into Kubernetes. Like I've used kubernetes before um i mostly my last job we mostly used mesos marathon and hasher corpse nomad um i never actually made it into the kubernetes space but it's something i want to learn do you have any tools you want to learn this year anything like outside of languages um real quick i just want to say hi to everyone in chat i got pablo prof mesh and naeem and sarab and gerald all over on the linkedin side of things 
Uh, Chris has Rust and WebAssembly, and I agree with that. That's so interesting. But uh, as far as tools, I am big on the JavaScript side. I like React a lot. Um, I definitely want to learn the view side more. So there's Nuxt on the view side that I want to learn more. And uh, so <laughs> React is a, a JavaScript library. Next.js is a JavaScript framework built on React. There's a new tool out called Blitz that sits on top of Next. Um, and that promises to kind of increase our speed of our workflows by like a billion percent. So I'm really excited to try that out. Yeah, that sounds that sounds pretty. Uh, yeah, that sounds really cool. I had a question and then my brain lost it, and it was oh, WebAssembly. Yeah, so I see a lot. You said you wanted to learn WebAssembly, and I see we have other people saying they want to learn WebAssembly. Is WebAssembly actually like its own thing? I like th I know in GoLang you can compile something down to WebAssembly. So I just assumed that it was a compilation target. Is it actually a language that you can write? And is it, is it a language that people do write or do they typically use a higher level language and then compile down to it? I don't know. I'm I'm not very familiar with this space at all. I know about it, but that's about all it is. I have the, all the information I have. Uh, you know what's fun about that is I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. It's one of those things that I've heard about a billion times, but I never like sat down, did a hello world uh, and jumped into it. So I think this is the year um, getting started. Let's just look real quick. Compile yeah, see, web assembly from from all these like yeah, GoLang and then with Rust. Um, there was a big push at PyCon 2019. There was a keynote where someone talked about being able to get Python to compile down to WebAssembly, so they could use Python in the browser, which sounds amazing. Yeah, that's cool. I guess why am I even looking at it if I'm already writing JavaScript, which is compatible in browsers? Which is pretty much, pretty much <laughs> WebAssembly already. Yeah, that's pretty uh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyone else have any? Uh, what else do you want to learn in chat? Anyone else have anything? We have Chris here does a lot of React Angular and has done React in the past. Check past. out that next message. That's interesting. Oh, this one. <laughs> Uh, Were you saying hey or the? <laughs> I said hey to myself. <laughs> uh, this one, yeah, we're UI product that interface with Kubernetes clusters, so people can front their apps to Kubernetes without knowing it. That is pretty interesting. Hmm. Oh, and that here it says we says Pi03 is the project which compiles to WebAssembly. Um, so yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, I remember this being. I remember watching this keynote in person, and it was pretty neat. All right, I expect a lightning tutorial in next week's cloud chats on web assemblies. Pio <laughs> yeah. three. I'll I'll look at it. I, I I guarantee I don't know exactly what it is. Um, but I need to text uh, my roommate <laughs> because I just heard him play trombone, and that's that'll be a fun thing. Right on. Well, let's uh, move into the newsflash segment of this yeah. of this stream. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, if, I'm a little, if I'm a little distracted right now, I'm looking out my window. And so those of you that know, I'm in Austin, Texas, and I'm lucky enough to still have power right now, but no water. And it's snowing again. And I'm moderately upset about these things. Um, so hopefully it does not snow that much longer. And But if is anyone else tuning in who's currently stuck in the snowpocalypse of 2021 out here in Austin cuz just so you know you're not alone I'm I'm out here weathering the weathering it with you as well <laughs> But cool yes let's move into newsflash okay so for those of you that don't know newsflash is our section where Chris and I go back and forth and talk about news items that are moderately rel moderately relative to us or relevant to us and we um just go with it so uh, for me, Rust 1.50 was released recently. Um, I'm going to, with this, we have uh, const generic array indexing, const value repetition for arrays, uh, safe assignments for, to manually drop T union fields. Um, but yeah, that's that's what we have there for Rust, which I guess since it's just had a new release, I guess we really should learn it, Chris. Uh, yes, I don't know what any of the syntax is. Very I've only ever seen these little arrows 
recently in TypeScript. That honestly, that looks like Java. Like as an old Java programmer, that looks like some Java. Like, looks like object instantiation in Java. I know mm -hmm. that the, the the thing the thing that makes Rust cool is that it does memory management for you, but you can opt not to do memory management. Like that's what I was always kind of told is that it like it allows for dynamic dynamic memory allocation. But if you don't want to, you don't have to, but it's really good for it if you do. And I have seen that Rust is now outperforming C in certain benchmarks, which is monumental. Um, I, I, I wish I had the art, the link for us, um, but we totally saw like Rust outperforming C and like it's the first language that's been able to do that in a long time. And, and that's really exciting. That's interesting. Yeah. Right. We could we could potentially start to see ha huh, see we could see you know operating systems start to implement part of the kernel in Rust. It would be interesting. I think it's I think it's an interesting world. Interesting new world. I mean C C's held dominance for 50 years now. Um so it's be curious to see if it moves. Okay. Yeah. I'm uh I'm just happy to make things look pretty on the front end. <laughs> <laughs> kernel development is scary. Uh, cool. So I've got the next one, and my newsflash for this week is um, if you are a Laravel fan, which I am very much so, Laravel just released a new tool called Spark, and they have had Spark out before, and Spark is basically Laravel's tool to help you build a SaaS app. Um, so this next version of Spark actually does a lot of things for you. Um, building a SaaS is tough stuff, especially if you talk about, like, authentication, uh, API authentication, tokens, uh, team accounts. Um, and then especially you haven't even gotten to invoicing payments, uh, taxes, all that stuff. Spark's uh, main thing is to help you with the payments and authentication side of things. So basically, um, it hooks you into Paddle or Stripe, and you can charge subscription payments. You can charge uh, individual payments. You can give people a dashboard so they can download their invoices, which I found to be such a pain when I built it. But um, yeah, the Laravel ecosystem has brought out a lot of fun tools, and Spark is the latest. So let's see, subscriptions, um, location billing, invoices, PayPal support, all that good stuff. That's really cool. I definitely, I, I love watching like your, your Laravel talks and stuff because it... it it just further solidifies in my mind that PHP is going nowhere. Um, like a lot of people don't like PHP. They don't want to deal with PHP, but PHP still powers a vast majority of our web. I think it's like 40% of the web is run on WordPress alone. Um, so it's, That's it's good. down though. Has it? I haven't, I haven't checked the numbers lately. I know that you, you keep a track of it. Oh, no, I no. I, rem I remember it being around 70 and now it's sitting oh. around the 40. It's 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 a lot. I I I was being moderately conservative with the forty because I remember reading it, but I remember seeing every everyone always reports higher numbers, um, but it could be a lot. So it's really cool to see PHP is still a thing and it's it's not going anywhere. Um, yeah. Maybe I should learn PHP. You know, well PHP just hit version eight and that thing is blazing fast. Um, so all of the and over PHP seven and PHP eight, we've gotten a lot of things where. Um, I don't know. It was made fun of in the past because it didn't have those things, especially speed. And now mm -hmm. those are moot points. So I think it's a great language uh, current day. Yeah. Well, um, it, the only thing that that'll stink is that, it, that it'll maintain that uh, it'll maintain that reputation. People still uh, say Python slow. Python two six was slow. Yes, Python three three two was slow. Um, we're at Python three coming on three ten now, and it's it's actually really fast now. Um, I mean, is it is it as fast as a compiled language? No, nothing, nothing. No interpreted language will ever touch a compiled language's speed. Um, and if it does, then man, we've we've made we've come such a long way. If it does, but so yeah, I'm. You'll probably still see that stigma, but hey, there are people that make good money contracting out PHP work. So I, I like yeah. it. It's it's cool. I'm glad Laravel's doing well. This is a, a good question out of chat though from Mateo. Is PHP worth learning uh and i'm kind of on the fence of i know i said earlier you should learn the vanilla version of a language but i mean you should definitely learn php if i think the laravel ecosystem is such a great way to build full stack apps you can build out apis in like 
uh, five minutes. You can build out a SaaS app um, by hitting install on Spark. But should you learn the core language first? Probably, but I think you can jump quickly to the Laravel side of things. Um, how do you feel about Python and like the frameworks on that side? So if if you if you're going to be using something like Flask, you have to know Python because like it, it mm -hmm. won't it's 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 basically it, because it's a micro framework. Now, when you do Django, you still probably need to know like the core language. Um, like you need to know what am I thinking? Like you know, up to like data structures, kind of. You need to know how to do ifs, loops, and stuff. But then you do get into the Django side, and it is very specific to Django. But it it's mostly just the Django libraries are specific to themselves. Um, it still uses a lot of core functionality in Python. I know you had you had commented to me, to me once that like knowing Laravel is almost not like I asked you if you knew PHP and you're like, well, I know Laravel and it's not really the same thing because the framework's so divergent from the language. And I don't I don't know in in Python in Django and Flask, I think you'd still have to have, be pretty competent in the core language to be able to succeed with it. Yeah, and I I do think you need to know the language itself, um, but. Should you be building full apps first in just PHP? Uh, I'm not too sure about that. I think Laravel is has such good PHP um, fundamentals that I think you can learn PHP by using Laravel. Hmm. Um, but that I guess that's just like having a good framework that doesn't hide too many things from you and give you too much magic. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so the next item we have for our news flash segment is Golang 1.16 release. I swear I did not put these on here when and then like, what language do you want to learn? We both want to learn Rust and Go. Um, so Golang 1.16, there were no changes to the language. So the language itself, the core language didn't change, which is pretty interesting. Um, so what's in it? Uh, so it's the main thing is it has support for Apple Silicon. Um, and there's this new embed, uh, thing that they talk about where it, you can now compile static files into the binary. So if you were building a website in Golang and you wanted like to serve static files in it, you could now compile them into it. I've never actually seen that done. I've known a couple people that do it. I use Hugo, which is a static site generator written in Go. And I'm trying to figure out how that would help, but I don't think it really would because Hugo generates the static files. It doesn't generate a binary. So, but I guess if there are static files that you need, maybe config files, maybe, I I don't know. There's There could be things that you could do with that that could be very useful. I know a lot of people are excited about it. I'm not hmm. knowledgeable enough in the Go space to know why they're super excited about it, but um, it is pretty cool. Um, and here's the big one, 25% faster and 15% less memory. Yes, because Which there's no changes to the language, a lot of people are seeing this as a signal that we might this might be the beginning of Golang 2.0. Like because a lot of languages like I know like whenever Python's thinking about if Python ever makes it to a 4.0, I've heard and this is mostly just hearsay, so I could be wrong. Um I've heard that the like when they go from like 3. Dot, say 3.19 to 4.0, that's not the number, but there, there's going to be no change. All they're going to change is the number because they want to make sure they they maintain compatibility. So a lot of people think this is kind of prepping for a 2.0 change. Um, but every time there is a Golang release, I always hear these rumors. So take it with a grain of salt, but who knows? Right on. Um, so you're saying maybe wait longer to learn Go. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think Go. I think you could definitely start Golang prides itself on its backwards compatibility and like no version of go has significantly broken any previous uh builds with a few caveats but they're really small unlike you know say like python like the python two to three jump i think was one of the biggest like i'm not going to say failures because in reality there's a big story behind that but from the user side from the perspective side it was one of the biggest compatibility failures it, it's in textbooks i've seen it in textbooks in software engineering textbooks talking about how not to release a versioning system. Um, so Golang tries not to make that mistake. A lot of people have learned from that mistake. And again, there's a whole story behind that. It actually, and, and it's not, it's not as cut and dry as it seems, but yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know that branding kind of thing, especially when you're doing version numbers is very, very important. Mm -hmm. 
you can't you can't even give off the impression that you're going to burn the community, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's other ones I want to talk about, but we'll skip. Um, okay, so my last part for the news flash is kind of a fun project I saw on the Twitters uh, this past week, and this is called uh, Remotion. And it's basically a framework for making videos in React, which is really kind of interesting. I'll put this in chat. Hey, Arpan. Hey, Ashutosh. Welcome. Thanks for joining. So yeah, Remotion is a framework for building videos in React. Uh, and I haven't played with it myself, but it looks like you can build out like presentations. And you can even do like code walkthroughs, which I wonder if it shows in this thing. Oh, I don't want music. Um, so yeah, you can do stuff like this in React. So if you're doing like a talk at a conference, right, you can walk through your code like that while you're talking through your uh, presentation and you can build all of this in React. Huh. That's so, really cool. Yeah, something to look at when you're building out your next presentation. And then it gives you like this timeline that you can scrub through and kind of do edits in. Uh, so, you know, who needs ScreenFlow <laughs> at this point? Wow. Or Camtasia or Disc. Well, I love Descript, so. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've never actually, I've always just been a PowerPoint person, but I'm definitely trying to get, like, get somewhere else. Like, I want to try new tools. So, but I'm definitely going to have to give that a shot. Yeah, it's interesting. It'll, um, I don't know. That's how we're trying to get you on the front end side. We give you like these kind of small tools. <laughs> you keep slipping them in little by little, and then eventually I'm a front end developer. Trojan oh, horse over here. It would be scary. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so let's move on to this week at DigitalOcean. We actually have some pretty cool announcements. Um, we have recently launched our Navigators program. Chris, tell us what about the Navigators program. So the Navigators program is the idea that there are some amazing, amazing contributors, uh, you out there in the community that have done amazing work for uh, writing and teaching people how to host apps, how to build apps, how to pretty much just being great tutors in the space. So the Navigators program is the idea that we would love to support you in your journey of helping others learn how to code, learn how to build and deploy apps. Um, so if you are somebody that loves to be in the community, to teach in the community, and to build cool things and talk about it, uh, we'd love to kind of tell you about our Navigators program. It's a program where you can apply, and uh, if accepted, you pretty much get direct access to hanging out and talking with us about um, how the state of the deployment hosting app world goes uh, and pretty much get help for if you want to talk to any of our engineers or have questions about DigitalOcean itself. Um, we just try to support you on your kind of educational teaching journey. Yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be really fun. I'm looking forward to getting to work with it. Um, you know, you get a lot of you get a few perks with it. You get, you know, cross promotion from us. You if you're going to be building stuff out for us, you'll get um you'll get credit for DigitalOcean to build out tutorials or whatever you need to do. You also get to meet I think once a month with Chris and I where we'll tell you terrible jokes um that nobody likes. And that's that's part of the program is that you have to listen to the jokes. Um, no, but like, we'll, we'll meet up with, you'll meet up with us and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll learn from each other. Like we'll show we'll share with you some of the tips and tricks that we've learned about how to do all this stuff. I guarantee you the navigators are going to have a lot of things that they're going to bring to the table that they're going to teach me, which I'm super excited about. Um, I think we've already accepted 25 people into the program and we're, we're currently going to be sending out, if we haven't sent out the things yet, we will be doing it soon. Um, but yeah, it's a really cool program, and I hope that everyone, uh, anyone who wants to apply, just please feel free to apply. We look forward to seeing your application. Yes. Um, and yes, you. if you want to sign up for the jokes, we could just have a joke thing where Chris and I just tell bad jokes. So maybe we'll have a, a joke sign-up uh, program as well. So 
That's something we can do on stream is build a bad joke, joke generator. Generator, do an API, and then um, you know maybe that's something you can send to all your friends that you want to get back at, like bad cat facts. It actually is something that we need because like I found a few of them online, but sometimes they have some rather tasteless jokes. So we definitely need to make one that is like available for everyone to be able to use for their terrible punny jokes. You know, if, if, if you're not having everyone in the meeting groaning and putting their, their hands, their face in their hands, you didn't, you didn't tell a good enough joke. So we got to get to that point. Um, <laughs> uh, pan knows I was Googling actually for a bad dad joke generator api but there isn't one so maybe, oh i can't find it maybe we make it definitely sounds like fun <laughs> um and then the other thing for this section for uh this week at digital ocean our amazing co-worker erica heidi who we will definitely be bringing on the show sometime in the near future um she may not know it yet but she's definitely going to come be a guest um it released an ebook on how to manage remote servers with ansible Erica, in my mind, is one of the foremost experts in Ansible. Like I've I've used her tutorials on Ansible before I worked at DigitalOcean. Like I always came and looked for her stuff. Um, so she's now completed an ebook on how to manage Ansible servers. Um, you can find this by going to do.co slash cc dash ansible dash ebook um, to go ahead and just download it. It's free. These are free books. So you can download it in both PDF and EPUB format if you want it for PDF or if you want it for, uh, you know, like your reader or something. I actually do download tech books to my Kindle because sometimes it's nice to nice to have them like on e-ink. I really like e-ink, but that's a, that's a story for another time. Um, yeah, I just pdf open it in in my brow in my computer and just let the computer like sear my eyeballs to a crisp but that's right. okay that's i don't like pdf <laughs> books i've never been like once i got to e-ink i was like oh good i can save my retinas um without having to sear them like to medium well on a screen on a monitor um david east what's up welcome welcome um gerald welcome yeah uh cool i think that's all we have for this week at do um lightning tutorials chris what do you have for us today okay so lightning tutorial is uh on the schedule we had i was gonna walk through alpine where's my computer alpine js which is a really fun front-end javascript framework um but uh, and you can think of it like Tailwind for JavaScript, which I think is a really apt description. Um, and that sounds like fun, but I did not prep for this, unfortunately. So what you are going to get is a Tailwind uh, tutorial. Uh, so I'm going to go into CodePen. Love CodePen for doing like demos like this. Uh, and let me zoom in. Or actually, let me save this. And I'm going to say demo for... Uh, let's do Tailwind grid demo for cloud chats. Cloud chats number three. And I'll, don't worry, I'll zoom in. I know it's uh, kind of tiny right now. Okay, so presentation mode. And I'm going to bump up to 20 pixels. Too small. Um, or maybe I'll zoom in. Mm, yeah. Okay, so start us off. Uh, the reason I'm doing this lightning tutorial instead is Mason talked about CSS Grid earlier and how cool it is. Uh, let's go here. I am going to add Tailwind right here. And Tailwind is kind of a really fun CSS framework to build out your UI pretty quickly. Uh, and I'm a big fan, especially recently. So what's cool is if you're not familiar with Tailwind, it's basically... And you're gonna, if you're not familiar with Tailwind, you might not like this tutorial because I did not like Tailwind when I first started. And that's fair. That's um, completely fair feedback on Tailwind because it kind of looks like inline styles at first. So if I wanted a height on this, I would say height is screen, which actually translates to height is 100 VH. 
Um, and then like, let's say I wanted a background, I can go background red at 400. Um, so now we have a background there. And you might be saying, Chris, I already hate it. It's inline styles. Aren't we trying to get away from inline styles, right? Um, and I thought that at first too, but the speed of which you can build out your UIs pretty quickly is really awesome. Like um, Tailwind actually comes with 10 shades of colors for each color. So there's 100 to 900. So I can go like 100 is, uh, is really light. And then I can go to 900, which is kind of a dark, closer to um, it's almost. Auburn. It's kind yeah. Of Auburn color, yeah. There you go. Um, you have better naming words than I do for colors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually already liking it because I still do inline styles. And I think that's what drives people. Bond. Like, like, I still love the EM and the strong like, why, why did we get rid of those? They were perfect. I want something bold. I make it bold. Why do I need I think, a CSS class for that? I think they're still here. <laughs> they're still here. But like every time I go to like W3 school, it's always like, these are deprecated. You should be using CSS to bold your text. And I'm like, why would I do that? It's easier for me just to do strong. Um, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> See, I told uh, this is how you know I'm not a web developer. <laughs> <laughs> So um, you asked for like CSS Grid earlier. The cool thing about this is, let me give this a background of uh, red. No, let's go for blue. We're uh, doing cloud chats here. So it would be blue. Um, the cool thing about this is you can actually create a grid right here and div, div, and then I'm going to do like, a div inside of this, and then let's say we want the background white, um, rounded corners, and then let's give it a padding of five all the way around. Where's Emmett at? Oh no, there's no Emmett. What's going on? Okay, hold on. Div class background white, rounded uh, padding five. Hey James, quick, what's up? Uh, okay, so check this out. We have a little white box. And I can do like P20 all the way around just to get some padding. Okay, so if I created like a bunch of boxes like this, now we have a bunch of boxes, right? Not the coolest. But what you can do with CSS Grid is you can say class is I want this to be a grid. Um, but check it out. Nothing happened. The thing about CSS Grid is you have to define your grid. So you have to define your columns and you have to define your rows. And to do that in Tailwind, you go grid columns is three. And automatically, you get three by three all the way down. Um, hmm. So three columns and it'll just fill the rows as needed. Or you could do like grid columns five, right? And there's uh, five across. And then the cool thing about this is you can say gap is five. You can uh, create a gap. So instead of doing like margin right, margin right, margin right, you can just say, I want our grid to have a gap of that. Um, and then the other really cool part about this in CSS Grid is that you can specify each one and tell each child div how uh, to space itself in the grid. So let's say I wanted this one right here. You could say column span two. So that one would actually take up two columns now, and everything else would like flow down. So then I could just like randomly pick this one, row span three, and you can start to build out really fun like I was gonna say masonry, uh, mason mason grids. Yeah. So you can build out really fun mason grids just by doing. Uh, defining your grid on the parent and then just saying each one, hey, I want you to be this, I want you to be that, um, and all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah, that's really cool. That's way more than I can already do. And I looked it up because I'm seeing in chat, I was, it was not strong in EM that I was always getting yelled at. I used to use B and I for bold, and that's against the HTML, the, according to the HTML5 spec, that's a last resort. So that's the ones I used to get like told no mason don't use the b tag for bolding your text which i like so i think i'm actually gonna like this because i like inline stuff um but yeah that's that's already way more than i can do with the front end so 
Yeah. So we'll check this out, right? If you have this grid, you can actually do some fun stuff where you give each one kind of a fun background. And then you can do this. You can say transform uh, skew 12 or like skew 6 or something like that. Do I want that? Hello? Um, transform. Okay, now it's not working. Hold on. Um, transform. Oh, I need to do a skew Y. My fault. Um, so you can like angle things, oh, right? Look at you all fancy. And then if you give each one its own background, you can actually create Stripe's old homepage with the grid. So like you see this box, this box, this box, and these two boxes down there, that's all CSS grid tilted. So that's my uh, lightning tutorial for today. Oh my goodness. That's cool. That's cool. I'm going to have to learn it. It still looks scary, but I'll have to learn it. It's like you're saying all these magic words and it just works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tailwind is not a replacement for CSS knowledge. I think it's just a way to make writing the CSS shorter because you definitely need to know what is happening with each of these classes, right? Um, but I don't know. I wonder if Tailwind, like starting on Tailwind, does it help you learn the CSS side? I'm not sure. I don't know. I'll have to look into it. I, I, I've seen you really liking it lately. And I guess it's worth me looking into because it's like, you know what you're talking about when it comes to this stuff. So <laughs> I definitely don't. Uh, it's all good. That's what I'm here for. Sweet. So I think we now finally are ready for a new segment that we haven't done yet on the show, which is we're going to have a guest interview. Um, today we're going to be interviewing Phil and I'll let him introduce himself. So we're going to go ahead and bring him on with us. Let's do this screen and then this screen. Hello, Phil. How are you doing today? Good. Am I here? Yeah, you're here. We can hear you. Yeah, I've made it to the cloud chats. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, yeah. So go ahead. Just tell us what, like, what you do, where you're at. You know, the the typical. Hello, my name is Phil. <laughs> Hello, my name is Phil. Um, I am a senior product manager here at DigitalOcean, uh, focused on that platform. So, been working on that for almost a well, a little over a year or so. Um, so basically just yeah, working on bringing out uh, new features to users and trying to build an awesome experience. And I've been at the company for uh, two and a half years. Prior to this, I was working on a DOKS and the container registry. Awesome. So were you, were you one of the, uh, like, have you always been a product manager at DigitalOcean or were you an engineer uh, at some point in, uh, at, in, at DO? I know you're originally from ServerStack. Like you have ServerStack background, which yeah. is... For those of you that don't know, ServerStack was actually the predecessor to DigitalOcean, correct? That's right. Yeah. So I joined ServerStack back in 2007, maybe, or 2008. So it was all dedicated servers and, uh, you know, the wild, wild west. Um, and I was doing system administration and uh, it was a small company. So it was like, you're doing sales support, uh, network administration, sysadmin stuff. Uh, so it was a really awesome learning experience um, joining there. But uh, after that, I kind of went on to doing kind of like, more sysadmin stuff, DevOps type roles, uh, building in the cloud. And then actually DigitalOcean, I had a startup prior to DO. Um, and then this is the first time I've kind of been a product manager. So it's been cool though. Nice. Awesome. Uh, cool. So I guess, so you, so you, you and I have a very similar background where we both did DevOps and sysadmin stuff. Um, and like, I remember when Docker came around and it was like, this just new tech. So from your career, did you see at is the changes that we've seen in cloud and in tech? Have you did like, did you see those coming? Like what's been the most surprising about everything that's happened? Because if I look back to like even 2011, when I started, I did not foresee what we're currently dealing with today, like what the current state of cloud is. So what about you? What did you, what do you think? Yeah, it was kind of like when, I mean, at ServerStack, I mean, when I first started there, it was like we had a shell script, you know, to like set up a new machine kind of. Um, and as we progressed, we kind of like, you know, we'd be able to pixie boot and 
uh, you know, put, put machines in a certain VLAN, reboot them, and they would get like puppetized. Mm -hmm. So we started, uh, you know, using configuration management um, and started kind of seeing the automation there. And then after I left there, I just worked at another startup um, where we were using all AWS and uh, we just had a ton of different clients and like this need to be able to deploy really, really often. We had a really big development team and just kind of saw like the uh, configuration management started to break down in terms of like um, speed and like getting things pushed out on a large scale really quickly. Um, so I was really interested in containers. So I was messing with like LXC and Mesos and trying to build like a PaaS kind of back then, you know, and then so when Docker came out, it was like, hallelujah, like, <laughs> wow, like a solution to my problems. Like finally like, these like building blocks of PaaS uh, are starting to be open sourced. And yeah, the transformation since then has just been really cool to watch. So I think I kind of like wished it was coming, um, but when it, the tidal wave that we've had kind of since like 2013 of uh, just like open source technologies that just help so many people accomplish so much has been really neat. Yeah, it really has. It's been, I this this exact same situation you were describing is like exactly what my old job was, except with like we, Mesos and Marathon for building our own paths. Like you bring up something and it would puppetize it. And like, it's like, ah, it's just all these, all these things. Uh, yeah, for sure. Hey, is um I, I haven't really been in that side of the space much lately. I think my bat line, my last experience there was like, is Chef still a thing? What happened to I Chef? Think, yeah, I think Ops could I mean uh, well Ops Code became Chef. It's the company became known as Chef, I think. I believe it's still a thing, yeah. Um I know they tried to come out with their own kind of like container orchestration platform in like twenty sixteen or so. Uh, Chef got bought. Yeah, they so got I think by Progress. I don't know that company. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think right I think I mean, yeah, I did a lot of chefing in my day, so um, had some good some good success with it. But it's just, I mean, in terms of wrapping your head around it, if you're not like, if you can't program at all, really, like just like Docker makes it so much more easy to yeah to do everything. I feel like I was the only one that was a salt stack person. I, I talk to DevOps people all the time and everyone was always chef or puppet and we were using salt stack at my first job. And I loved salt. Once you got past the, 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 the meta, like this is a pillar, this is a grain, like with, with their own naming convention. And yeah. I'm like, uh, don't make people learn new words for things they already know. Yeah, totally. I kind of missed the salt thing. Like I, and, and Ansible too. I know you guys were talking about that. Um, sort of like was out of, configuration manage I was I was just using chef basically with Mesos and stuff until until uh container container times. Was Chef first to the space or was Puppet? Uh no the first was like CF engine and then Puppet mm -hmm. and then uh Chef I believe. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It looks like SaltStack joined VMware October last year. Yeah, they did. Like, so Chef was bought by Progress in September of last year, and then Salts. Like, I remember SaltSack was immediately bought. It's, it's been weird. config management has been a weird space in the last year, but and Ansible was acquired by Red Hat in like 2016. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it was. It's like all the big, all the big players now have their own config management tool. <laughs> yeah, you know, and their own Kubernetes platform. So yeah. <laughs> So, um, for everyone in chat, could you give us a walkthrough of what is App Platform? Sure, yeah. Um, so, App Platform is a uh, platform as a service. Um, the differentiator is that uh, we've built everything on top of cloud native technologies. So, um, Kubernetes, uh, Kineco, um, uh, Container D, and a whole host of other things. And uh, so it allows you to really easily connect up your Git repository uh, or container registry. So we support GitLab Cloud, uh, GitHub, um, our container registry, and more coming soon. And basically make it really simple to get your apps deployed. So we support static sites, but we also support dynamic services, jobs, workers. And we kind of have this like component-based approach that makes it really easy to kind of reason about 
and about all the different parts that make up your application. And you can start out really small um, on that platform with a f uh, three free stat static sites. Um, and then as your needs change and you kind of need to add some dynamic backend services, uh, it's really easy to do that without having to make any kind of drastic changes. And um, after that, it's easy to scale out from there. So we're kind of trying to like build something that is doesn't kind of lock you into a black box um, and gives you a lot of options in terms of how you you know how you grow your application. Yeah, I really love the componentized approach of like that mental block, uh, like the mentality of building blocks to put together your app. I really like. Yeah, that was something that like. I think we were, well, you know, we were looking around, like doing research about like how we wanted to design this thing. Um, I mean, it's fine if you only have like, you know, you're running one service, you're running one workload in in, a, in the cloud or on on a PaaS. Um, but as you kind of expand out from there, it you you have to kind of keep that mapping of how all these different things fit together in your head in a lot of cases. And so we wanted to make it easier to like, okay, I want to go look at the metrics or logs for all these interrelated things in one place. Uh, so that was definitely a big kind of like driver for, you know, how we designed it. And also with like the app spec, um, which is kind of the built, like the building block, the basis of how you interact with that platform, either via the CLI or the API. Um, it's the same kind of concept. So, you know, making it really easy to define uh, these either simple or really complex relationships in a way that makes sense, makes sense, I think. I definitely like the like the the component aspect. I think that's something that was refreshing. It was something that I hadn't seen before, and it was really, really cool to be able to just keep things organized. Like I, as you know, I used to manage like my my last job. We we, we ran a PaaS and stuff, and one of the things that like it was just it was the wild west. Like everybody's service was its own page, and it was really hard to see. Like like I remember trying to like debug diff like these three different services are misbehaving. Let's see some correlation and just finding everything. It was such you had to go through so many hoops just to be able to get it. So that's really cool. Yeah, and like um, a lot of times you were in, you were in charge of setting up, even like the way that you could even mm -hmm. jump through those hoops, hoops to be able to debug it. You know, uh, yeah, problem in itself. So it is. It definitely is. I love it. Yeah, it's really cool. I and I guess it's 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 really awesome because I'm glad because like you and I were both part of the uh, the design sprint. So like I love how much effort DigitalOcean puts into maintaining simple products um, because building simple products is hard. And, I, um, and I've, I've definitely found that like, it's easy to make something that's complicated that nobody can use. Like right. something that only I understand, but making something that resonates with everyone and the amount of work that went into that um, was really inspiring. Do you have any, do you have any cool anecdotes about that process? Like, um, yeah, I think that, I mean, that was a really fun process to be a part of for sure. And was super instrumental in kind of like us building the right mental model around how we wanted to, you know, get this thing going. Um, I think the really great thing about DigitalOcean when it comes to simplicity is like, yes, it's simple, but that doesn't mean that it sacrifices like features, right? So like, I think the app platform is cool because you're, or yes, it's simple, but it can still scale out, right? Like you can still grow your business on it. Um, and that I think is, that's that's the challenge is like, how do I, how do you do both? And so I think that, you know, we're, I, I hope that people think that we're doing a good job when it comes to that. Definitely. Uh, let's take some qu some questions from the chat real quick because we actually have a couple that I think would be awesome for you to answer, Phil. So Tony sure. says, uh, we he's seen disclaimers that app platform is not really recommended for production apps. Uh, can you use app platform for production? Oh yeah. Um, if you saw those that have been during like our either like a beta beta period that we had, um, it's totally ready for production. So we have some really exciting, pretty large scale uh, customers running on the app platform. So definitely have no fear uh, when it comes to to getting your production apps deployed for sure. Yeah. Awesome. And then Mateo asks, um, how is app platform different than our pre configured marketplace droplets? He's still trying to figure. He's still trying to wrap his head around that. Sure. Yeah. So um, when you're, you know, if you go and launch a pre-configured marketplace droplet, you're, you know, you're literally getting a piece of software on the droplet, which is great because it's super simple and easy to get going. The difference with that platform is you're not having to worry about any droplets or any servers at all. So you just care about your application and the fact that it's running and working. We manage all the infrastructure, so it's all running on uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters. Uh, that are, you know, distributed across all the various regions that we have. We handle kind of like the ingress, the load balancing, um, 
uh, and ensuring that your apps stay online. So if you know one of them was to fail, uh, we'll automatically restart it or move it to a healthy server if necessary. Uh, or if you deploy maybe a breaking change in your code and the deployment fails, we'll automatically roll back to a working version. So uh, it's just more managed, I'd say, and uh, easier for you to kind of scale either up or out once you're ready. Awesome. Yeah. That's cool. If you have any more questions for Phil feel, or about App Platform or anything in general, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, sure. We're here to take your questions. Uh, uh, and also, yeah. Phil just did a... When was your stream, Phil? Yesterday? Uh, for what's new with the App Platform? Uh, feels like yesterday. I think it was Tuesday. It's a couple okay. days ago. Yeah. Yeah, so that was um, a lot. Yeah, let me drop a link to uh, the chat in there. And uh, Phil did a video on what is new with App Platform. So if you want to like walk through the features there, um, definitely check that out on this YouTube channel. Definitely. Yeah. So we kind of walked, we, I talked in that along with Moises, who's another product manager on the team. We uh, went through kind of all the features that we've added thus far since we launched um, back in October. So kind of a refresher on, you know, what's, what's in there now, if you haven't kind of, if you missed the release notes or some of our blog posts. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I, l I love the speed that you guys have been adding new features. Yeah. yeah. And y'all y'all have a lot more on the roadmap too. Like y'all have a lot of fun things that we can't talk about today. Uh, mm -hmm. but we've got some I guarantee you it's nothing but good times coming, right? Yeah, there's a lot of exciting stuff coming. Um thing a lot of things that uh people have repeatedly asked for and some things that people haven't necessarily asked for, but I think are gonna be really uh, really awesome and get people really pumped about the app platform and some of the new cool things that you can do with it. So definitely keep posted for, for some updates in the near future. Super exciting. I love, I love seeing the new things y'all are coming out with. It's been really fun to watch this product take off. Mm -hmm. um, now that we've added it though, do you, do you foresee a migration from infrastructure as a service from droplets and maybe people that are running their own Kubernetes to paths on the horizon? Like what, what do you think? Do you think that the industry itself is about to start taking a shift to more managed services? Um, I think it depends on like the business obviously, but uh, I think generally speaking, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of uh, either developers or, uh, startups or even small like SMBs out there that have dove into Kubernetes because they really need a lot of the benefits that Kubernetes provides. But it's also, you know, obviously a really steep learning curve. And um, there's a lot of overhead when it comes to managing a Kubernetes cluster, or there can be. You know, so I think that something like App Platform can relieve a lot of that burden by still, but still offer a lot of the benefits that 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 the users are looking for. I don't think that like Kuber managed Kubernetes or Kubernetes as a whole is going to go away for everyone. Um, I think managing, I think manually managing servers uh, without any kind of automation is probably not something that's gonna stick around forever just because it's painful or can be. Um, and it doesn't give you as much flexibility to make changes or to be as agile. Uh, but yeah, so. I don't know if that made sense, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know it, it made sense. Uh, my, uh, one of my old directors at, at Expedia used to talk about what he would call post DevOps. And it was how, if you got, if you didn't want to do any work, you just get him talking about it. Um, <laughs> and it was basically the idea that eventually companies will build platform teams and internal passes will become kind of like, if you, if you're either going to run on a managed pass or you're going to have a team that provides a pass for, the people because like we currently see in DevOps space, we see a lot of people that like we see front end teams that manage the service that have a Kubernetes expert on their team that deploys. And I kind of feel like that model is mildly unsustainable. Um, I feel like it's kind of, I think it's really challenging to ask, to <laughs> ask people who just want to work on front end stuff to manage a Kubernetes, to manage their own Kubernetes nodes. Yeah, um, I totally agree. I mean, I had a, in like the startup I had prior to DigitalOcean, I kind of had the same thesis where it's like, okay, people like aren't going to want to do DevOps forever. Or a lot of companies have trouble hiring for for it. You know, it could be challenging to find someone that even knows uh, the stuff to to build it. I and mean, can you trust them to build the right thing? Um, so yeah, but I think there's still you know there's still the use case of like the huge 
some huge organization that is going to be going to want the control either because of compliance reasons or whatever else, you know, to be able to run their own stuff. But for the large majority of people out there, it's probably a recall and, and a pain. Yeah. And that's, that's a big thing that I've, I've been a big, I, I've been a big proponent of like, don't use Kubernetes unless you know, you need Kubernetes. Your, you know, your little web shop, probably like your, your little like marketplace shop, like Shopify use, like you don't, if you're going to build a small point of sales app, you might not need district, like, you know, multi-cloud distribution for, yeah. to sell your little figurines. I think that might be a little bit much. Uh, so yeah, some pre, some like uh, premature optimization, you might say. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I I think the best advice I ever got, and I, it was from like my last job, where it's like if you're not in the business of selling it, don't build it yourself. Yeah. Like I'm like if you're if you're so if you're building a shop, don't build your own pla platform as a service unless you plan on selling it. We, like you're 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 just taking away resources that could be going to the thing that makes you money to do something that you could just buy from someone. So, and I do love that app platform tries to not lock you in. Um, like, and I, that's, that's one of my favorite features about it is that it's just a, it's that code runs anywhere and it's awesome. Yep. Yeah. I, I think that's like a huge selling point for sure. And I think there could be features in the future that will like make that, uh, even more like evident in terms of not being locked in. So, um, yeah, it's good stuff. Awesome. So we're wrapping up here. We have one more question, and then we have our wrap up question. So, um, just 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 for a thought, like what? It's a hypothetical, but like say it's like 2025, 2030. It's it's in the future. Um, a software engineers graduate from colleges or boot camps and stuff. They want to start building. You know, whenever I graduated from college, it was get a droplet on DigitalOcean and start building your stuff because that's I graduated 2015 ish. Um, and while while Google App Engine was a thing, it really wasn't a thing. Um, not a lot of people used it. But now we, you know, we're seeing this advent of paths. What do you think? What do you think new engineers are going to gravitate towards? Yeah, they're definitely going to be gravitating towards paths or something that takes the pain out of having to do anything outside of building what they want to build a soft with their you know their programming languages of choice. Um, so yeah, I, I don't see a future in 2025, 2030 where People are like running dedicated servers for themselves or even, you know, logging SSHing into VMs and like compiling like Apache and PHP or something like I just not very highly unlikely. I think Paz mm -hmm. is like here to stay and especially like this like kind of cloud native based Paz is definitely here to stay um, for sure. That said, I think that people that want to learn the nuts and bolts and guts of how all this stuff works under the hood, that's still a great opportunity for a career path as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like I love, I love doing DevOps stuff. And like, I think I would still personally run servers, but I guarantee you I'm going to be in the minority for that because yeah. I, because I just like it and it's fun and it's neato, but I do find myself like as a, like I used to use droplet all the time, like, but I find myself reaching for app platform more than I thought I would. I thought that it wasn't going to be a Mason thing. Like I thought I was going to stay in server land. I think we were in the meeting together and I was, I was explaining, <laughs> I was tell, I was adamant about these things. And now I'm like, that's a lot of work. Like I, do I really feel like configuring a WSGI? Cause I do, I'm a Python. I do a lot of Pythons. Do I really feel like figuring out how to do Nginx and G unicorn again today? Or do I just want to make app platform do it? And I'm finding myself being a convert. So like, it's definitely really cool that, that like, that's that like I've I've changed in the four months that it's been out. I've changed the primary way that I deploy applications and yeah. I never thought I would. Totally. Yeah. I mean, like I, I'll give myself a pat on the back for in the past. Like I, I've built storage arrays and like configured like huge MySQL clusters and like Nginx and whatever else. Right? Like I don't know. I, it's been there, done that. Like it's fun, but not that fun anymore. <laughs> it, it is. I, I think if we just were... We're capitalizing on the fact that the DevOps and sysadmins are tired. Yeah. It's like, like it was fun when I was like, whenever I was young and I was, I'm, I'm, I'm 28, I'm not old, but like 23 year old Mason was like, yeah, let's do this. And now I'm like, can we just get it deployed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, totally. Yeah. Uh, SSL certs is what, like I would always spin up a droplet and I would mess up the SSL cert so much that I'd be like, all right, let's just destroy and recreate the droplet and try again. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I've I've done that before. The amount of times that I've accidentally locked myself out of a droplet is non-trivial. 
because I I'm still bad at IP tables to this day. I'm still bad at IP tables. Oh yeah, I've definitely done that too. And then like you're like having to. I mean, then if you're on a dedicated server, it's like you. It's like hard coded in there. Then you got, you're getting you're like connecting to like a like a VNC console, or you're like getting remote hands in the data, data center to connect it so you can fix it. Like just <sighs> yeah. My first job, we we built physical appliance, like we built an operating system for physical appliances. So going into the DRAC and like, okay, I got to download oh, yeah. the DRAC and like get oh, into the this DRAC. Stuff. I haven't heard that in a while. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Uh, okay, James, we have we have some questions pop up. Are SSL starts <laughs> automatic in DO? They're automatic in app platform. They are, yeah. So every app you deploy gets a Let's Encrypt um, cert automatically applied for it. And uh, we also will automatically redirect HTTPS for everything. So it's all HTTPS by default. I love that. I've, I've given so many talks where I'm like, <laughs> where, where I... Where I do the cert bot and it's like, do you want to redirect HTTPS? And I'm like, well, since it is the 21st century, yes, I do want HTTPS. <laughs> like, like it shouldn't even be a question anymore, but yeah. I know, I know it has to be, but, uh, okay. So wrap up questions. These are going to be questions that we're just going to ask pretty much everyone every time. Cause we kind of okay. want, it. uh, so what was your first programming language? How did you get, how did you get into programming? Um, my first programming language would have just been like the shell. So I was like running FreeBSD. I had like a little network in my parents' basement made up of really old computers. Like some of them had like 200 megabyte hard drives. Uh, <laughs> they were headless. Then I'm like talking like a 486 DX, like running OpenBSD, um, NetBSD. So I, I messed with a lot of shell. Then um, I got really into Plan 9 for a while. I was running like a little Plan 9 network. If you guys know that. Uh, Bell Labs operating system. Oh wow, yeah. that's a that's a phrase I haven't heard in a long time. Yeah, yeah. And then the really first like real like programming language I like learned learned was C plus um, plus in school. And then I did computer science, and back then it was all C plus plus still. Um, and it would then it became kind of Java for like uh, most like comp sci students, at least as far as I'm aware. So mostly that, and then uh, yeah, further along, kind of Ruby. Nice, nice. Um, and then now, if say you're going to go build a, a sample app or like you're going to do something just for fun, what programming language do you reach for first? What's your primary language now? I would probably still like try to run something with like Ruby and Sinatra um, and like JavaScript, the front end. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I don't really code anymore. So if I'm like, uh, if I'm doing something, it's like, I'm like hacking together like a quick shell script to like parse something or, you know what I mean? So it's, yeah, more, more on the business side these days. So unfortunately, yeah. I, I feel <laughs> that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Phil, for joining us for being our first person we interview on cloud chats. Yeah, um, it's awesome. It's awesome having you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. This is great. Really. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, any other parting, parting thoughts or anything before you head out? Um, put me on the spot. Uh, you can say no. Check out check, uh, check out the app platform. Definitely welcome everyone's feedback. And uh, you know, we our roadmap is based heavily on the feedback of the people who try the product and let us know how what they think. So um, please give it a shot because I spend a lot of time thinking and worrying about it, and uh, really appreciate um, you know any time you can put into it. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Phil. And we hope to have you back again sometime later to hopefully tell us about some new app platform stuff in the future. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Awesome. Well, you have a great day. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Awesome. Awesome. Ah, I love app platform. I've been really enjoying it. Uh, same. Yeah. I, I did a, a deploy yesterday, but um, React app, one click. Super fun. I um, do a lot of web Python stuff with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I built a... Yesterday, I built a DigitalOcean... Deployed a DigitalOcean button config generator. Um, so hopefully, we can add that to the docs and uh, add more resources for that. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Sounds like it might be a lightning tutorial coming up, too. Not lightning. It took three hours yesterday. No, not building it, using it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> like, oh, well, you, okay. You, can't, you, can't fit, you can't fit three hours and ten minutes, Chris? I know you can. <laughs> um, I'll record the video of myself and just, you know, speed it up. 
Oh, that'll be fun. I love I love it when things sound like the like uh, uh chipmunks, Alvin and chipmunks. the chipmunks. That would be great. Uh <laughs> Okay, so that's all we pretty much have for today. Next week's events, we've got some fun stuff coming up. Chris is going to be doing a webinar on Laravel Livewire on February 24th. Uh, what, what are you going to be talking about in that, Chris? Yeah, so Laravel Livewire is a tool um, that kind of helps bridge the gap between you're building a front-end single-page app in JavaScript or you're building a Laravel app Usually, you build a Laravel API, you build the front end, you connect it through the API. Uh, Livewire kind of does this thing where it says, let's skip that middle step. Let's kind of do this. So I'm interested to kind of work a little bit more with that. It's uh, A lot of people are having fun with it. So next week on Wednesday, we are going to talk about that. Awesome. And then next week on Thursday... It's gonna be it's gonna be a it's gonna be a absolute marathon for our reviewers because I have to do my tech talk and then immediately we're doing cloud chats and we're only gonna be able to do a 30 minute cloud chats because there's a company all hands. So next week's gonna be a little bit different. Chris is gonna be out. We're gonna have a special guest co-host who you're gonna love because I really enjoy him. Um, but I'm doing my tech talk next Thursday. Uh, I don't remember what time. I think it's at 10. Uh, if only I could click on things. Uh, yeah, ten o'clock on keeping your sites and users safe using SSL. It's going to be part, um, like educational where I'm going to talk about what is SSL. We're going to talk about TLS, the TLS handshake, like how it actually, like we're going to go in like a little bit of like like the academic side of it, like how does SSL and TLS work? And then I'm going to demo Certbot. There's new web servers now, like Caddy, that have SSL built in by default. We're going to so I'm going to kind of go over like the fundamentals and then we're actually going to do build a couple apps with SSL and uh, explore all the fun space that is website security, which I actually really enjoy. Yeah, that sounds fun. I remember learning about SSL and how that handshake stuff worked mm -hmm. um, back in college. And I don't know. I think a lot of that stuff, I don't want to say should be uh, like taught in, primary school but uh <laughs> just just knowing how i don't know the web works is very important these days it is it is and like i'm i sit on an industrial advisory board for uh the university that i went to and we talk about um like what should students know and like i think like in, in universities right now networking is still not a required course which made sense in the 90s um it doesn't make sense in the 2020s so definitely definitely going to go over that it should be I, I'm a big proponent of CS education. You could wind me up like a little toy and I would just sit here and talk about it for hours going in circles. So uh, we're going to make sure I don't do that right now. Um, we had, um, I had a networking class and I have never heard people cheering more than the day our professor said, you know what we're doing today? We're building our own ethernet cables and everyone freaked out. <laughs> I've done it. I used to wire all of my own apartments because for some reason, <laughs> ethernet cables used to be really pricey, but a spool of 500 feet was a dollar a foot. No, no, it wasn't. It was like a hundred dollars. So whatever that math is, um, it was, it was a dollar a foot if you bought it outright. Um, and then I bought my own, I bought like a hundred foot of cable and I, or 500 feet of cable and I bought a crimper and I for years, I crimped my own cables, and I never want to do that again. Uh, okay, I love my networking class. It was fun. So last thing, as always, it's my joke of the day. Chris, are you ready for a terrible dad joke? Let's hear it. We should uh, actually write these down and put it in our API. I really should, yeah. I think I remember the last <laughs> ones that I've done. So here's the joke. Why is it not a good idea to use the phrase beef stew as a password? Uh, you just guessed my password, but okay, why not? <laughs> because it's not stroganoff. It's not. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's got to be good. That's good. Yeah, people love it. I see. I see our moderators like put their head on their desks. So I, I had to spell it in my mind. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I love it. It's good. Okay, well, thank you everyone for tuning in. We went a little bit long today, but we'll be back next week for a special shorter cloud chats because. Scheduling is hard. Uh, if, you've, if you're a computer science student, you already know this. <laughs> uh, but scheduling is hard. And sometimes people put things in places and you're like, oh, well, 
womp. So it's going to be a special short episode next week, but then we'll be back to our normal schedule uh, going forward. So thank you, everyone. Have a good time. We'll see you later. Thanks, everybody.